message. That's what we're doing. Today's going to be different, just a smidge. Um, the, today is my 40th anniversary for ministry. Okay? So um, I, I really try not to make ministry about me. And I don't talk about me unless it's a story of something stupid I did. And so that we get, you get the value of my stupid, right? And so those are the kind of stories I usually tell. But today I want to take just a minute and talk about 40 years of ministry. So I'm going to, sh- in just a second, I'm going to show you some pictures of ministry of, through the years. Uh, and then give you, we'll read some scripture and give you some, some thoughts and guidelines on what ministry is. But I want, I want to, the reason I think 40 years is, Wild. First, I'm only 35, which is a thing. But um, one of the reasons that I think for, that 40 years is wild is because 50% of people in ministry don't last five years. They jump into ministry. Four years is the is the average that someone stays at a church as a pastor, and then they're. Uh, I think I've been here for 14. That sound right? Might be 15, I don't know. Um, I don't count that. But, um, but 50% of people in ministry last for five years. You may have seen this statistic. Every month, 1,700 pastors quit. Which is mind-blowing. Um, only 10% of pastors that begin ministry make it to retirement still in ministry. Ten percent make it into minutes and make it to retirement age, and um, also according to uh, some research we did this week, uh, seven out of ten pastors admit they don't have a devotional life, which would explain the previous statistics. Most likely, I'm just thinking. But uh, so anyway, so please indulge me for just a second. We're going to show you some pictures. We've dug through the archives of my attic and found some some pictures. So I don't know if you can uh, put something up for me here. This is huh huh. Yeah. So yeah, it looks like does that look like Ian? Ian, stand up for a second. Turn around so I can see you. This is my son Ian. Yeah. That's me teaching in Mexico in the Bible school. I've taught in four different Bible schools over the years. You can, you can probably go a little bit faster. That's, that's Zach. That's Zach in ministry right there with us. Uh, back when we used to always wear ties. Every Sunday you wore a tie no matter what. Um, go ahead. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing there other than holding a plaque of some sort. Um, and apparently we did communion that Sunday. But go ahead. I'm preaching in Mexico, and I'm actually interpreting for the young lady who ended up being a missionary in Indonesia after, after this. So this is us in Mexico someplace. I have no idea, but they liked purple, apparently. And um, baptisms in our backyard. We had an above-ground pool for 10 years in Oklahoma. Did a lot of baptisms back there. Um, go ahead. Uh, praying over kids. Apparently, that's the same Sunday as the other one because I have the same shirt on, so I guess that's a thing. But go ahead. I actually played guitar back in the day. Yeah, isn't that crazy? So that's our praise team. That's Elena uh, in the white sweater in the middle there leading. She was our worship leader um, way back when. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, That's Ian. And little baby Ian in that picture. You can only see the crown of his head. But... uh, that's us praying over some, some people in our church when we lived in Tulsa. I've pastored in seven different churches. Um, I have no idea what that was, but that was before the goatee, so that was pre-2000. Uh, preaching in India. I was, went to India with Brian Porter back in 17 or 18, I can't remember which. I guess 17 based on what I saw there. This is also India teaching in a Bible school there. Doing a crusade in the streets in India. We saw a lot of healings that night. That was really amazing. And same, uh, same trip to India as well. And that's probably here. Be my guess. I don't know. I'm glad I didn't wear the same shirt. I guess that's good, so... 
baby presentations. That's for Alexis. Yeah. And our Mother's Day panel that we did just this uh, a couple weeks ago. And our missions team that we just got back last Saturday, not yesterday, but the week before that. And that probably brings us up to date. I think that's the end of the pictures. Oh, there's one more. That's it. Okay. So cool. That's it. I looked for, I know there's a picture somewhere where I'm wearing parachute pants and I have a mullet, but we couldn't find it. Well, darn, you know? So, all right. So uh, that was the end of that. So open your Bibles with the First Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter 4. Who wants to see that mullet picture? Yep. There was a time where I actually had a little ponytail way back when with a suit and a tie. But yeah. So 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I want to read um, a couple of verses here. I'm going to start in verse. I want to talk about message wise this morning is being in ministry for this long. Of course, I've seen stuff. And I've learned stuff. And so I want to kind of give you like my top 10 lessons over the um, top 10 lessons I've learned in ministry over the last uh, 40 years. Most of them I learned the hard way by doing it wrong. But um, here Paul in 1 Corinthians 4 is he's defending his apostleship or his ministry call. And I think there's some really good nuggets we can get out of this passage for, um, for what, it, what it costs to do ministry or what is required to do ministry, right? So verse 1 says, this then is how you ought, ought to regard us, ministry, as servants of Christ, that is, that is primarily our role. I know that some people get into ministry to be, uh, like, you know, to be famous and to be important and to be served by others. But I, I think Paul tells us here very clearly that we're servants first, servants of Christ, and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. So I mentioned to you that seven out of 10 pastors admit they don't really have a devotional life. Well, how are you ever gonna find the mysteries if you're not hanging out with the Lord and digging in them, right? So um, we're, to be, we're to be people that dig for the mysteries, verse two. Now it is required uh, that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful, and faithfulness is such an important quality for, for being in ministry. Um, I'll, I'll say in my, my list of, of lessons I've learned that if you are, like if you are flashy and exciting but don't have faithfulness, I'm really not terribly interested. Does that, does that make sense? And so uh, faithfulness is so important. At the, at the end of life, the Lord is gonna hopefully say, well done, good and faithful, not, hey, you sang pretty, right? You, woo, good job, you know, doing a thing, but well done, good and faithful is the goal at the end. Verse three, um, I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. And, and interestingly, in ministry, everybody has an opinion. And everybody wants to uh, say, this is how you're supposed to do it. But at the end of the day, I'm really responsible to him. Right? And I think that's what Paul is communicating. We're responsible to him for what we do more than anything else. And the cool thing is, is his opinion doesn't change from week to week. <laughs> I'll leave that there. Um, Verse, verse five, therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. And so our motives are hugely important as well. Why do we do what we do in, in ministry? Are we doing what we do to be seen, to be applauded? If we're looking for the applause of 
man, then we will not receive the good and faithful comment at the end of the end of our lives, right? And so motives, the Lord measures and weighs the motives. Um, verse six, now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos, who was a fellow minister, for your benefit. So it is beneficial to the church that we apply these concepts to, to our leadership so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written, then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us against the other. And so remember at that time, people were saying, oh, I follow Apollos, I follow Paul, I follow Cephas. And so Paul is saying, no, 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 we follow Jesus. And it's all about pointing towards Jesus, right? We're not, we're not to follow a person or follow a man or even, I think we make this mistake of inviting people to church when we should be inviting them to Jesus, Right? I love this church, and I think this church is fantastic, and I would not want to go anywhere else, but we're about Jesus, not about church, and not about me, and not about us. Does that make sense? And so he's saying that if, I mean, and we've, we've seen people in ministry, I'm sure, that, that are puffed up, and it's about them, and it's about my ministry, and I do this, and I'm so great, and it's really not. It's about Jesus. And so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump down to verse 13 to continue reading. It says, uh, when we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. Which again, you, you think, you know, that's terrible. But if we take that attitude as a servant in leadership, then we, we recognize if it's not about me and it's about Jesus, then I, it doesn't really matter how I get treated. Does that make sense? And so Paul's like, hey, you know, you say something mean to me, I'm going to respond kindly. I'm not going to claws out. You treat me poorly, that's okay, because it's not about me, it's about him. And if the world hated him, they could hate me too, and I'd, it's okay. Does that make sense? Uh, verse 14, I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. And I really see this congregation in so many ways as my Children, And so when I bring a message, and sometimes it's very corrective, it's because I see you as my kids and I want the best for you, right? And I will give my kids a hard time, my, my biological kids a hard time. Ian's shaking his head in the front row. It's because I want the best for you, right? If your whole, if your whole life is lollipops and never broccoli, you're not, you're not gonna be a healthy human, right? And so... We bring you warnings as dear, dear children, 15. Even if you have 10,000 guardians or 10,000 teachers in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Uh, you, re you remember the, when we did our baptisms a couple weeks ago, we took the screen down and people have autographed their name on the wall where they were water baptized that, that's about fatherhood. That's about saying we're bringing you into a place of spirituality where you're making this commitment to Jesus. And so in the sense, we've, we've birthed you into the kingdom, right? And so we, my, my role is not to be like, you know, let me be super teacher. My role is to father people in faith and to guide them along in, in that. Um, 16, therefore I urge you to imitate me, which is really difficult if you think about it for a second. You know your kids imitate you, right? It's really funny as you see your kids growing up and they're, they start doing your facial expressions and they, they start saying the same things that you say and that's really that's like, oh, I gotta behave better because my kid's copying me and... Um, so as a leader, as a pastor, I think if everyone in the church behaved like me, would we still be okay? Okay, think, think about this for a second. If everyone in the church behaved like me, if you worshiped like me, you gave like me, you prayed like me, and you did ministry like me, would we be okay? And that, that's important, 
right? Because, I, I mean, again, I know people that are, are ministers that don't have a spiritual life. They just, they do what they do. It's a job. I, I know those guys. Um, I know people that don't love people that are in ministry. And you're like, really? I mean, they're there because they, they enjoy the show. That they, there's not a sincerity. And, and I, want, I want to live a life in Christ that if you copied me, that it, the church would be okay. Right? I mean, obviously, I'm not going to, you never see me over in the dancing corner. And I'm kind of quiet and reserved in some way. So if you we were all like me, Bible, we would follow Jesus. You know? Um, Verse 17, for this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. What's important in that verse is he is giving ministry away to the next generation, and Paul is consistent, okay? He's, he preaches the same message Everywhere he goes, because not like, you know, hey, this is the only message I know, but there's a consistency of message. And I think the consistency, and you've heard me say this here before, if you want your life to go well, consistency is king. Okay? Um, and, I, and I say, I have said these very words to you guys. If you save $10 today, so what? But if you save $10 every day the rest of your life, you'll actually have some wealth. Right? If you ate a salad today, so what? If you eat healthy every day, you'll have good health. Right? So ju just doing it once doesn't matter. And so spiritually, you know, hey, you prayed this morning? Great. We'll do that every day. That's consistency will lead you into some victory. Okay? So Paul is showing giving away ministry and he's showing consistency. Verse 18 now. Some of you have become arrogant as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing, and then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. Verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline or shall I come to you with love and with a gentle spirit? And I think having a gentle spirit is really important in leadership instead of cracking the whip and beating people on the head with it. I think walking gently with people helps us to be better parents and better ministers in the gospel. Does that make sense? So that is, that is our theological foundation. So what I want to give you uh, for your notes are uh, 10 lessons learned or 10 guidelines for ministry that I have um, thought through and figured out for, for ministry. These are not necessarily in order of importance because that was way too much brain work. And I'm going to, I'm going to skip the obvious ones the obvious is love Jesus, love the Bible, and pray. That's the foundation. These other things are after those, right? So if you don't love Jesus, love the Bible, and pray, then what are we doing here? So let me give you 10 things that I think are important for ministry that have helped us to make it 40 years in this, in this line of life. All right, you ready? Number one, be first to serve. Be first to serve. The New Testament does talk very little about leadership. It mostly talks about servanthood. Okay? And for, for us to succeed in ministry, we need to be the first ones to serve. Are you the first one to pick up a table and move it or stack chairs? Are you the first one to get involved and do the, the dirty work that's involved for ministry? Be the first to serve. Paul introduces himself frequently in his letters, I, Paul, servant of Christ, right? And so if I serve you and I serve church, then I'm also serving Jesus and because I'm serving his kids and serving his bride. And so I constantly want to be the first one to serve. 
hey, we're doing a thing, let me, let me put my hands on it, right? As opposed to I'm sitting back and I'm watching people serve and asking people to do what I would never do, okay? And so I think being the servant is super duper important for us. Uh, Mark chapter 10 Verse 45 says, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so we need to understand that we are here to serve. If you're in ministry, whether it's kids ministry or preaching ministry or greeter ministry, we're here, we're serving people. I'm serving the Lord and I'm serving you. And, and, that, and one, once that's my heart, then doing anything is not difficult. Is, is there, hey, you know, we, got, we got a toilet that, that blew up. We need to go clean, you know, mop. Well, that's fine because I'm first server. I'm, I'm, I'm chief server in the house. That's the way I think about myself. Does that make sense? And you, if you've been around here long, you've seen me cleaning up coffee spills and stacking chairs and moving tables and doing all those things, okay? And I just don't think I'm too big for that. Does is, is that make sense? Well, I'm too important. I cannot. I could not put paper towels in the dispenser for people. No, just, just do it. Does that make sense? You will be happier in ministry if you're here to serve. Just saying. So my second thought is guiding principle or thing I've learned. Raise up and empower people for ministry. I talked a little bit about this last week, but I do not want to take ministry to the grave. I want to give it away. It's about, it's about giving away the, the opportunity. It's, it, to some degree, it's about creating the opportunities to give them away. Right, we were in uh, Texas. We were to do a wedding several years ago. This was pre-COVID, way back when, and we uh, met up with a young lady in Austin, where we had been in ministry for a while, and we were just hanging out, drinking a cup of coffee with her. And she was a youth director, youth pastor at a church. And so she, we're sitting there, and she says to us, "You had me." get up and pray over the offering, and I was terrified. I thought I could never do this, but I did, and then you encouraged me, and then you gave me more responsibility, and she was leading our drama team that we had back in the day and all these different things. She goes, to, you gave me fo- like baby steps to victory, and now I'm in ministry, and I'm leading people, and I'm giving ministry away. And I looked at that, and her name, her name is Annabelle, and I just thought, man, that's the best. You, we love you. That's so cool. And, and we want to continue to give away ministry, right? Ministry is not about us. Ministry is about us doing things. Does, does that make sense? Uh, sometimes it's, it's like Elena did um, announcements today because I forgot to get someone to do announcements, and she was close. It's like, hey, can you <laughs> Can you do announcements? I forgot. I forgot to find somebody. You know, so sometimes there's some of that. And um, I can't tell you how many times Ian's played piano because someone called out of piano at the last minute. Our daughter, Johanna, plays piano. And I remember one Christmas Eve, the piano player didn't show up. And so like at 20 till, the, serv- the Christmas Eve service, I called this guy. And he goes, oh, is that today? And she's like, God. Oh. And so here's Johanna, she's probably 10 and taking piano lessons, like, baby, I need you. I need you bad. What do you got for Christmas songs, you know? And we didn't do Rudolph, but we did, you know. So she's up there and she's, you know, playing piano. And she was close. We just took her. But we, we need to raise up ministry, raise up people from ministry. My life is to give it away and watch, okay? One of the things I loved about our recent trip to Mexico was I got to watch. I preached on Sunday morning, preached on Sunday night. I never preached again the rest of the week. These guys preached. These guys shared their testimonies. Uh, They were interpreting for each other. That was so awesome. I literally sat in the back of the room and watch them do ministry, and I was, like, I was high on life 
not doing it because they were doing it. And just knowing that we here had given them opportunities and built them up, baby steps up to that task, that was just so refreshing. Does that make sense? So raise up people and empower them for ministry. Uh, Number three is call people higher. We need to call people higher. That is to say, we need to set a biblical expectation for people that are in ministry. Okay? It's, ministry is not about, hey, you're a super talented person. Ministry is about your call in Christ. Okay? And Zach and I have, have talked many times about worship, and we would rather have, I would rather have a B-plus musician who loves Jesus than an A-plus musician that we hired from wherever. Okay, so we need to call people to a higher standard. That's that's excellence where possible, but that's that's their love for the Lord, their relationship with the Lord. Uh, I think that the standard should be higher in church than it is in the world. Okay, um, Ephesians four, uh, Paul says this verses twenty two, twenty three, twenty four. It says. Um, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your mind and to be and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, righteousness and holiness, you know, and so if we see in people that there, there's a lot of backbiting and gossip and they're dropping the ball all the time, then we, we, we're going to sit you down. Because it's really about calling you higher, not just learning to put up with your stuff. Love you. Okay. Uh, so number four is kind of similar. Character counts. Character counts. Uh, We've learned to promote character and not promote anointing or talent because anointing without a solid character is going to fall over. Okay? If 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 you're, imagine a table in which your character is the base that supports the anointing that the Lord gives, and if your character is a toothpick, then you can you can sustain a postage stamp of anointing. But if your character is a tree trunk, then you can support like a whole truckload of anointing, right? So character counts. I believe that it's integrity that will sustain the move of God. The Lord wants to come in and he wants to move, but if we're not people of character, then it it just kind of fizzles. It's like, yeah, and it ends up being nothing. And so your character is important. so that when, I, when I say character, I'm talking about people that are true to their word, people that do what they say they're going to do, people that are able to lead themselves. Part of adulting is making yourself do what you don't want to do because it's the right thing to do. Right? That's part of being a grown-up. Part of being mature, you know? Very few of us love to do laundry or mow the yard or all those things, but we do them because we're grown-ups, right? So be a grown-up. I've discovered in Character Counts that your, your inner desires really determine your destiny, What you meditate upon becomes who you are. And so a part of character is taking your thoughts captive and doing what you're supposed to do because it's righteous and holy. Okay, so character counts. Um, Everybody good? The fifth thing that I've learned, and this is probably one of the hard ones, is uh, trusting God. Trust God. Because there's, there's this desire to be excellent and be amazing and succeed, but then that lends us to pushing and doing it on our own effort. Okay? And so in my mind, ministry is a sequence of praying, 
waiting, pushing, waiting, praying some more, hoping, hustling, waiting, pray. It's just all these things. It's, it's not, you're not in a bulldozer pushing things along. You're in partnership with the Lord. And so there's this piece of I'm trusting him. And if it turns out well, it's the Lord. And if it broke down, it's humans. You can never take credit when it's good. You know, like when, when you watch the post-game interviews of, of like uh, coaches or, or athletes, you know, if they, if they win, the coach says it was the team. And if they lose, the coach says it was me. Right? Or the team leader will, you know, y'all won, y'all did great. Well, you know, it's our team. But if they, if they lost, the, the team leader is going to stand up and go, oh, well, I just really wasn't. And they take the blame. In ministry, if it goes well, it was all the Lord. If it goes terrible, it was all us. Okay? And so that's, that's a big piece of trusting the Lord. Anything that happens is his credit, which if we understand that properly, lets us rest in him. Okay? So we rest in him. I think a ministry that's based on my effort and my strength and my smarts is exhausting. But ministry where I trust in him, that can be, there, there can be some shalom in that. There can be some peace in that. Does that make sense? Number six. Go ahead and put it up there. Don't get offended. You will have so many opportunities to get offended. Okay? Last year, when we were in Mexico at this church in Extampa, I'm getting ready to preach. It's Sunday morning. I'm in the back of the church. I'm praying. Or maybe it's Sunday night, but I'm back at the church. I'm, I'm walking. I'm praying during worship. And this woman comes up to me. And she says, I'll translate for you, but she says to me, she goes, Pastor, in all honor and respect, your hair is thinning and looks terrible. <laughs> right? And, and so then she, she goes, but I have some special soap for you that will help your hair grow. And I can't get past my hair is thinning and I'm just like, I'm getting up to preach just thinking... Don't turn backwards, because then you'll see the spot, you know? And so, so, I, so I survived. I preached this year. I finished preaching. I walk off the stage. Same woman walks up to me. Pastor, I have total honor and respect. Here's my soap. It's like, Thank you. <laughs> Why am I telling you this story? Don't get offended. People will say stuff. I told the pastor, I go, Pastor, you know, this, this. <laughs> I'm just like, oh man, come on. <laughs> you know, keep her away from me. <laughs> just crushes me. But people say things that they think that they, maybe they think it's good or maybe I don't know, but don't get offended. Offense will come, Jesus said. Opportunity for offense comes. But there's that 70 times 7 thing. And don't keep score. Okay? You, if you're in ministry, you have amazing opportunities to learn to forgive people. And people say, and when they're like a TV show, the kids say the darndest thing. Church members say the darndest things. And you just, you can't let it get to you. Because if you're focusing on the thin hair lady, then how, then how are you focusing on the Lord? Right? And um, we had a, a, a lady, a pastor, walk up to us years ago, and she, we were talking, and she goes, you know what, you guys, if you don't get offended, you just might make it. 
Best advice ever, right? So don't get offended because offended people don't finish well. Offended people finish bitter and alone. Don't get offended ever. Examine your heart. If you're offended, just let it go, okay? I remember, there was one time we were here at the, um, you guys remember the Vandy's at the, um, at the mall? Yeah. Um, so we're at the Vandy's at the mall. There's a big bunch of people from the church and we're sitting around, we're eating lunch or dinner or whatever it was. And I, it's like the conversation's going on and all of a sudden, the, you know how the conversation kind of does this? And one of the guys on the other end of the table says, well, you know, pastor doesn't preach real good, but he's nice. And I'm just like, I don't care. Whatever, bro. I'm not going to get offended. Because I don't preach good. It's the Lord. Whatever happens is him. And I'm okay. And I don't care. Does that make sense? So don't get offended. They parked in your parking spot. We don't care. They sat in your seat. We don't care. Okay? They wore the same clothes as you or they whatever. We don't care. It's okay. Don't get offended. So number seven. Here's only 10. It'll be okay. We'll get out of here. It'll be fun. Uh, love people well. I've learned in ministry that loving people well is super important. Okay? We were at a, uh, some sort of a Spanish pastor's conference in, in Dallas one time, and they had this guy. Uh, he got up and he spoke, and he was, you know, dynamic and all the things. And um, after, after everything was over and people have left, um, his wife and my wife are in the bathroom and he is standing out in the hallway and I'm standing out in the hallway. And so I decide I'm going to, you know, introduce myself and have a conversation. And it was like talking to a, a wall. He was like amazing dynamic on the stage. Like, woo, hair's on fire. And I'm like, hi, how are you? My name's David. And he just kind of looked at me like, I was like, hey, yeah, I passed her in Tulsa and blah, blah, blah. And he just looked at me, never responded, never said a thing to me. I was speaking Spanish. He spoke Spanish. He had preached in Spanish. But his personality was, I just don't talk to people. And I walked away thinking, dude, you're a jerk. Okay? I don't remember his name. I just thought, whatever. Point number six, don't get offended. Um, <laughs> but from things like that, I've learned, you know, people just want to be loved well. You want, people want to be noticed. People want to be heard or listened to. And if I, can, uh, if I can stand out on the front patio and shake your hand and high five you and ask you, you know, how your cat's doing or whatever, then um, that wins because people want to be loved, right? Jesus came to love us, right? So I've learned in ministry that it, it's not about me. I'm the servant. I'm, I'm the chief lover of people and I will love you well. And, um, you know, you call me, I'm just, I'm going to answer the phone unless it's two in the morning, in which case I probably won't, probably won't happen. But, um, and now, you know, I've been traveling lately and some of you guys have called me and my phone rings and, uh, like Brendan, you called me the other day and I was in Bulgaria. I just answered the phone like, Oh, Hey bro, what's up? And we talked, I answered whatever your question was, blah, 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 hung up. And I was like, you never knew that I was not here because I love people. Does that make sense? And so if you're going to be in ministry, it better be because you love people and you love people well. You respect people. And uh, if you're not here, we, we do notice and we do miss you. And my, my wife's great about texting people and, hey, I didn't see you. We love you. We're checking on you. We really do. We sincerely care about you guys. Okay? Except for Lloyd. We don't really care. No, I'm just kidding. So... Two more weeks, three more weeks, three more weeks till we get married. Bishop and Zach Sapp got married yesterday. Outside. It was so hot. That was the fastest wedding ceremony ever in the history of the universe because we were melting. One of Bishop's uncles came up to me and was like, Yeah, hey, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you go fast. I did, he did not, so I don't know. Number six, don't get offended. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, number eight, 
I don't know how you feel about this one, but this one's truth. I work for God. Okay? I work for God. You may think I work for you, but I don't. We'll see how this goes. But um, God is my rewarder. God is my defender. And I work for the Lord. And this, this may shock you, but I cannot tell you how many times over the years that people who have either they're, they're big offering givers or they're very they're important pieces of ministry have tried to use that to manipulate me to get their way. I actually had a conversation with somebody who was a large giver years and years ago, and they basically said, if you don't fire that person on your staff, I'm leaving. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and I'm just like, sorry. Because at, at some point you realize, if I do that, one, I've kind of done like I'm selling my soul, but wh where will it stop? Right? And so it's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry we cannot be in agreement here. But I work for the Lord. And if you're going to leave and take your checkbook with you, then that's okay. The Lord will take care of us. Okay? And that very kind of thing has happened several times over the years with people who are no longer in the building. And it breaks my heart because I love people well. But at the same time, I work for the Lord, and I'm here to please him. And we've had people come to us and say, um, you know, we, we hate the kind of music you guys do. Uh, change music or we're leaving. And we're like, we, we don't work for you. We work for the Lord. We're doing, what the, we're doing what we feel like the Lord is calling us to do. And that's, you know, worship's too long, too loud, too whatever. That, that's okay. We work for the Lord. <laughs> You know, I will do my best to make sure that I love you well, but I work for him. Does that make sense? And so I know those stories kind of shock you to some degree. How many of you were shocked by that, those, that little series of stories? Yep, it really does happen. Sorry. So we work for the Lord. Number nine, almost done. Be yourself. I've, I have learned that I am me and I'm not someone else. Okay, there's a lot of great preachers out there that I enjoy listening to that I can't be them. I can't, I, one, I think I told you this, one time I tried to preach a message like T.D. Jakes <laughs> and that was exhausting and terrible. I really enjoy T.D. Jakes, right? Get ready, get ready, get ready! <laughs> But I can't do it. And so I'm just going to be me. Right? And, and so being your, my, my role is to be who God created me to be and do my, do my best there, not pretending. And, and we, we understand that um, imitation is a, um, I wrote this down because I don't want to forget. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Right? You've heard that expression? But in ministry, imitation is a sign of insecurity. So if I have to be like you to feel like I'm okay, then I'm, I'm really just showing you how insecure I am as a person. And I finally realized, you know, hey, I'm just going to be who I am. I'm just going to be who I am. And, you know, if you, if you don't like that I'm not yelling at you, because my throat hurts, I don't want to yell. Um, you don't like that I'm not running around the stage screaming and sweating and I need a towel. All right. One time we preached at, um, I've actually preached at Potter's house in Dallas in the Spanish ministry that was in the basement. And, um, <laughs> and the, the usher guy comes out to meet me and in the parking lot hands me a towel because T.D. Jakes preaches and sweats and has a little towel, right? So he hands me a, my own towel in the parking lot, and I'm like, no. could have used it at the wedding yesterday with Bishop because it was outside. <laughs> but 
It's like, I, I don't need that. I'm not going to get this worked up. I mean, I'm not doing burpees, so. Um. <laughs> but be yourself. Being fake is exhausting. Last, and the final thing about ministry that I think I've learned in the last 40 years is it's not about me. Ministry is not about me. I know today, I, it's kind of, I'm talking about me a lot, and please forgive me for that. Uh, it won't happen again until we get to 50 years, maybe, and I'll have a new list. But, um, <laughs> but ministry is not about me. It's about Jesus. And if I win you to me, then that's a, that's a loss. Because I cannot save you. And if I allow you to put me on a platform or, not, or on a pedestal, I think the expression is, if I let you put me on a pedestal, then I will disappoint you. Because I am human, and I do forget, and I do show up late, and I do make mistakes, and I do misquote scripture once every couple years, and you know, it doesn't happen much, but we did last week. So, um, but ministry is not about me. It's about Jesus. It's about the kingdom. It's about heaven. It's not even about new covenant. It's about the kingdom. It's about heaven. It's about his ministry, not my ministry. So it's not about me. And if you're in ministry because it is about you, then that's, that's probably really a problem. Okay? So ministry is rewarding and difficult. Ministry is rewarding, but it's difficult. And I can stand here today, 40 years in, and I'm thankful. And the Lord is blessed. And um, we have three kids that somehow love the Lord. And uh, we're still married. And, and God is good. Ministry is hard, but it's great and rewarding, and we love it. And I hope to be here for a few decades longer, if you'll have me. I mean, I'm only 35, right? Is that what we said? No. No, just kidding. I'll be 59 this summer. But hey. But it's not about me, so I don't usually tell you guys. Birthdays come and go, and I don't tell you because it's not about me. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to wrap up with... Um, who came? Yeah, thanks, Mikey. I saw someone move. I didn't look at who it was. Um, I want to pray two different, uh, two different kind of prayers as we wrap up our time together. And we do have uh, prophetic teams down the hall. I think uh, the Elkins are, are um, overseeing that today. Um, the first thing I want to I want to address is this: if you've been hurt by church or ministry, or crazy church people, or the thin hair lady, or whatever, and um, you, you've been church hurt at some point because people didn't follow these guidelines in ministry and they ran over you. I wanna apologize on their behalf. I wanna pray for you. So if that's you, I'm not gonna ask you to stand up, raise your hand, or any of those things, but if you've been, you've been hurt in church, by people, can we just roll that off to the Lord right now? Because He is He is the forgiver, and He wants to He wants to break that that offense and that frustration and that that uh, wound off of you and bring health and healing to you. So, if that's you, just close your eyes right where you are, and let's just have a moment where we say, "Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would touch our hearts this morning." Holy Spirit, we ask you to heal the wounds. Anytime there's people involved, Lord, we know that people hurt people. And so, Father God, I pray that we would, we would at this moment, we would forgive that, that pastor, elder, deacon, Sunday school teacher, whoever it was, whoever has said stuff to us and hurt us in some way. Father, we pray that today, we would lay that at your feet and we would forgive them fully. And Holy Spirit, we pray for an amazing healing, an amazing healing to come into our hearts. Lord God, that we would be free. Father, that we would not be concerned or, or worried about getting stepped on again or getting drugged through the streets again. Father God, that we would, 
we would have a, a soft heart towards you and towards ministry. Lord, I just thank you for healing us. Lord, we speak forgiveness over those that have used us in the past or abused us in some fashion. Father, we just say, we say we forgive them today in the name of Jesus. If we've been manipulated by ministry in the past, Lord, we, we speak forgiveness over them in Jesus' name. Father, just do a refreshing work in our hearts today. And we love you and we thank you today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the second, the second area that I really feel like um, we should take a moment and pray over is, um, as crazy as it may seem, a lot of you in this room feel called to ministry. And so we want to pray over you. Pray that the Lord would lead you and guide you and open the doors and show you the preparation pieces that come and come that need to come into your life. So if you this morning are, are thinking, I feel called to ministry. I believe God's calling me to ministry. I'm going to ask you to stand up right where you are. Okay. I don't know what it's going to look like for you. I just know what it looks like for me. Cool. Can we have can we have you guys come out and just come up here in the front? I don't want to like embarrass you too bad, but. Feel called to ministry. Praise God. Come on over here. Awesome. Yeah. So, Father God, we just bless you today. And, Father, I pray that you would touch the hearts of each of these young people that's up here today. Father, that you would minister to them. Father, that you would expand their vision, that you would open their eyes. And, Lord, you have an amazing, amazing future for each of these. Father, I thank you that your plans are beautiful. And so, Father God, I just pray that right now, by your spirit, you would minister to them, that you would rest on them. Father, develop within them this ministry. Give them dreams and visions. Father, as they read the scriptures, let, let the word of God come alive for them. And Father God, I thank you that through the lives of these young people, Lord, you can do amazing things and you can touch the world. So, Father God, we pray that they would begin to see fruit for ministry, that they would be excited when people come to know you, excited when they have the opportunity to, to pray with others and to minister to others. Father, I thank you that you have called us in this generation at this time. Father God, that there's, there's a need around us that is amazing. Father, I ask you to raise up amazing people of ministry to love others and to serve well. So, Father God, I ask you to touch them. I thank you for a supernatural anointing over their lives. I thank you, Father God, that you show them how to prepare and how to train so that they are ready when the moment comes to pass. Father God, I thank you that you equip us to do the ministry that you've called us to do. We receive that from you this morning in Jesus' name. Mm. And everybody said, amen. Awesome, awesome. We love you guys. Y'all be blessed. Go back to your seats. Cool. Look at that. It's not even 12 o'clock yet. What? So we're going to be dismissed here in just a second. I'm going to pray over you guys as a congregation. If we could stand to our feet. Uh, we do have vacation Bible school starting tomorrow night. Love to see all of you out, bringing your kids. Go by Walmart, steal a bunch of kids, bring them over here. It'd be great. Um, oh, is that illegal? My bad. Okay, so don't do that. But um, invite your neighbors. Come serve. Come hang out with us. Um, after service, as soon as we dismiss... Uh, are we doing VBS decoration this afternoon? What time is that? Uh, whenever you can come. If you want to come help do VBS decoration after Spanish church, come hang out and help us, uh, help us do stuff. It'll be a good time. So, so, Father God, I just speak life over this congregation. I speak blessing over them. Lord, I ask you to touch those from our church family that are traveling this weekend or this week. And Father, we just thank you for safety. Holy Spirit, we ask you to open our eyes 
to see the need around us that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus. Father, we thank you for it. Thank you for those who are fathers. Touch them, strengthen them. We bless you today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we love you guys. Have an awesome, awesome Father's Day.